There can be moments of time where you can put something on a hold recommendation or a neutral, as it's sometimes called. You know, but one of the, the things that I, I remember distinctly working very, very closely with the trading desk, I remember the head trader at one point showing me that he only had a buy ticket and a sell ticket. He didn't have a hold ticket. This is Net Learnings, the podcast that keeps finance and banking professionals ahead of the curve. In each episode, we focus on career growth and practical advice while mixing in the occasional war story. Join us as we tap into the minds of leaders and experts at some of the world's most notable financial services firms and enterprises. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to Net Learnings. I'm your host, Kyle Peterty. It's my great pleasure to welcome an internal guest, Duncan McKean. EVP of Financial Modeling here at CFI. Duncan has a decade of experience in equity research and financial analysis, and another decade plus in corporate training and financial education of all kinds of different stripes. So I think it's safe to say this guy knows models, and I can't wait to dig in. Duncan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much, Kyle. Really great to be here. Thank you. Lots of our listeners are CFI members, but, but many aren't. And so they may not know you all that well. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do here at CFI? Absolutely. Yeah, I run the FMVA program here at CFI. And as you mentioned in, in your uh, piece a moment ago, I've spent a lot of my career in equity research, about 10 years, and about 10 years since then in financial training with a large, large focus on, on financial modeling. I'm going to ask a really basic question, mm -hmm. but I've always found that you have a, an elegant way of, of explaining it. So on behalf of our listeners, what is a model and why is it important? No, it's, a, it's actually a great question. It's essentially a decision-making tool. I mean, you, you can think about the different decisions that you need to make in life. Some of them are easy and some of them are like really, really hard. Like, so for instance, you know, you think about, you know, should we go to the beach this weekend? You know, absolutely. You know, that's an yes. easy decision to make. Yeah. Yeah. So you agree. <laughs> okay. But then people think about, well, should we spend, you know, like $315 million to acquire XYZ Corporation? And you think to yourself, hmm, that's not an easy decision to make. You know, like I need some help with that. So people generally would organize all their thoughts into a financial model, which is like, you know, think of it as like a replica of the business and everything the business does. And they, they use that model as, you know, one of the primary tools, if not the primary tool to, to help them make that decision. Got it. So the feature of our interview is going to be around the five must knows for a successful career in equity research. We're going to get there. Before we get into that part of the chat, though, uh, there are some areas that I kind of want to unpack your expertise. In. And the first is around AI, right? So you're, you're working as part of an internal AI research team at CFI. So I feel like you'll have a ton of interesting insight. Like, what is this AI in finance project that you're spearheading? Mm, it's a great question. It's actually evolved over the months since we started it. It it started off as a reaction to everything that was happening with ChatGPT. It was just so topical a few months ago that we really wanted to dive in and see what it was doing. We realized pretty quickly that it was obviously very, very capable when you were giving it questions in text and asking for responses in text. But we quickly realized that it actually wasn't as useful when you asked it to use a tool, like Microsoft Excel, for example. So we expanded the, the scope um, of the AI and finance uh, group to start looking at things outside of ChatGPT, other forms of AI, and also AI tools which are already embedded in products like Microsoft Excel. So really what we're doing we're looking at all kinds of advancements in technology. And then we're specifically weeding them out until we can find specific technologies that are actually like useful in people's workflows, right? We want to show people actually, okay, here's this thing and here's how you can use it to get some of the things done that are on your plate. So obviously a lot of folks in various white collar jobs have different levels of fear about what you know, generative AI is going to do to their careers. A question I have is, will we ever see the human element of modeling completely removed from the equation? Mm -hmm. It's a great question and, and very topical because it's something that's been on everybody's minds and so many people are afraid of. Short answer is no, I don't think you'll 
you'll ever see humans completely get removed from the process. Really, you want to think back to like, you know, modeling as or models as being decision making tools. I can't imagine an environment where, you know, a company would make a decision, you know, like a, a decision worth hundreds of millions of dollars without a human that's at least gone in and, and checked what was there in that decision making tool. So it's hard to imagine a world where you'd have an artificial intelligence machine build the model, check the model, and then you'd blindly just do kind of exactly what it was telling you. But definitely, I think you're going to see humans, their role within financial modeling definitely going to change and evolve. You're going to see, I believe, AI taking up a lot of the really sort of repetitive and redundant parts of, of modeling. A lot of the build is going to be taken over. And then as, as a human, as a person, you'd want to then be kind of lifting yourself up to, to do more of the analysis and the auditing of the model. So I could definitely see a world where, where AI is, is doing, you know, very large percentage of the build. And then it's your job to know enough about the building to be able to audit it and then help to interpret what's coming out of the model. Yeah, you always hear these horror stories of many billions of dollars in losses due to like a tiny modeling error or like an inconsistency in a formula. And you can't imagine com turning it over completely to, to a machine without some kind of oversight. I would think that seems irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think humans are going to continue to be involved definitely with, with the audit process and you you can have ai is actually showing some some great capabilities in terms of model auditing like it'll help you identify inconsistencies but you'd want to overlay you know a human audit as well in that process i would think you spent many years in a variety of training roles you've done everything from like adjunct professorships to classroom training to now of course e-learning with cfi and You've worked with, you know, among other roles, a ton of investment bankers and equity research associates, I assume. Um, in your estimation, how many people do you think you've actually trained in financial modeling over the years? Oh, my gosh. It, okay, so first of all, it's a great question to, to one which I do not have a perfect answer. I, I would say after spending almost a decade doing in-person training, I, I would say during that time, I could have trained perhaps... 5,000 or more people, mostly in the, in the banking sector at financial institutions. Since joining CFI, I think just in the, it's been a little over two years I've been at CFI, it's probably been tens of thousands of people at CFI, just because we have the ability to reach so many more people than, than we do uh, in person in classroom training. Definitely. That's wild. Yeah. It's, it's crazy when you think about it, really. It's, it's really fun. Actually, I had a crazy, interesting conversation with my father the other day who, who was literally a professor for around about 30 years. And, and we estimated that in, in the last two and a half years, I've trained more people in that time frame than he has over his entire career. And I'm not, wow. you know, I'm not trying to boast. It's just that the technology that's available now really enables you to just to reach so many more people than, than you could in traditional sort of bricks and mortar or classroom environment. Sort of apropos that we're talking about how AI technology could reinvent certain roles. Education's changed significantly, and that's such a cool, that's such a cool conclusion to have arrived at. Hmm. Now, when it comes to modeling, they always talk about speed being very, very important. Mm -hmm. Other than taking CFI courses, free plug there, which we have yeah. many, do you have any other sort of like easy, quick to implement tips for people to be a either a faster or a more effective modeler broadly? Mm, it's a great question. Well, and I'm glad you added in effective as well, because it's not only just speed. It's also, you know, how effective you're being. I'd say on the speed, if we're just talking about the speed topic, it's, it's definitely like stop using the mouse, you know, like now, <laughs> like just don't use it anymore. You want to really think about you and the computer are a team. Your brain is fast and the computer's brain, usually it's called the processor, is also very, very fast. The slowest part of that whole system is where you're interacting with the machine. And if you're using the mouse, then you're using a really, really inefficient method of interacting with the machine. So the first thing is stop using the mouse, use the keyboard. That way your, your thoughts or ideas or commands will go from your brain 
to the computer's processor much, much faster. That's the main thing. But I would also say, don't stop at just learning Excel shortcuts. I mean, just continue on to all the other applications, run the whole operating system. And that's what I do. I generally like, I don't touch the mouse for anything. Like I, I just use the keyboard for, uh, for all applications and the entire operating system. And it's just, it's all about just, as I mentioned before, just getting your ideas into that machine faster so that you can get, you can get things done. So that's, I guess, answering your question about the speed. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of efficacy, I would say that maybe where a lot of modelers, not to say they go wrong, but maybe where they don't emphasize enough is they don't emphasize and spend enough time on the dashboards. You know, they think that models are just about the numbers, but really models are communication tools. And you got to think about your audience. You know, your audience is, you know, the key decision makers are very senior within the organization. Oftentimes you're talking about the board of directors. They don't necessarily want to look through like an ocean of numbers. <laughs> you know, what they, what they want to see is graphs, you know, exhibits, dashboards. And so you don't want to just tack on a dashboard as being an afterthought. You want to spend a lot of time thinking about what the audience wants and needs to see. And one of the, the primary things that, that we teach at CFI is that you actually want to start when you're designing a model, you start with the dashboard, design the dashboard, figure out what the audience wants, get that right. And then you back solve all the way through the model to, to figure out what are all the pieces you need to make that dashboard work. And it effectively, it's effectively like starting with the outputs and going backwards, <laughs> designing backwards all the way through the model to get to the inputs, really. Yeah. Counterintuitive. Totally counterintuitive. Yep. In what ways have you seen learning and or call it corporate training evolve over the years? Mm. So many changes in the last few years. Insane amount of changes. So really like you know, obviously when COVID hit, it forced the entire world uh, into the situation where uh, we all had to figure out kind of like remote work and remote training, like instantaneously. And so we went from this environment where, you know, a lot of the world was doing in-person synchronous training to this world where nobody was doing in-person training and it was all right. remote. Yeah, it's like 100% remote. But then it was a split between synchronous and asynchronous. And I think when the pendulum swung that far to the other extreme, what it made all of us realize was the, some of the things that were missing in that environment. And, you know, some of the key things that were really, there's some great things, but some things that were missing is like community, you know, like engagement and peers and energy and all of that stuff, which naturally just happens in person. How do you bring that? into that sort of asynchronous remote world. And that's, you know, that's what we're figuring out now as the pendulum starting to swing back more towards a balanced or hybrid training environment. How about a game? Sure. What kind of game did you have in mind? Well, the theme of the episode is around equity research. <clears throat> so I thought it'd be appropriate to do a game of buy, sell, or hold. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay, so here's a, like here's an example. I'll just I'll give you a term, yeah, and you say buy, sell, or hold, and give us a little bit of an explanation. We're not gonna we're not gonna give you a total a total cop out. So an example would be like country music. Oh, buy, gosh. sell, or hold. Okay, so I I used to be a sell, and then I went to Nashville like a couple of weeks ago, and and now I'm a buy. <laughs> I just saw okay. some unbelievable like unbelievable country guitarists play and. And now I like have a brand new appreciation for country music. Okay. But, um, yeah. So I love bye. it. Well, you, you, you know, the game if you, 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 that's, that's it. It's that simple. And I'm glad you had a good trip. So, so here I have a list. Mm -hmm. You ready? Yep. Buy, sell, or hold the Atkins diet. Oh gosh. I, I'd be a sell. So, and to be honest, I don't remember the exact specifics of that particular diet, but what I do know is that all these diets keep coming and going, you know, and we think we have like the silver bullet solution. And then, then there's a new silver bullet solution, like a couple of years down the road. So I'm like, I'm like a sell on one specific diet and I'd be like a buy on like just 
all things in moderation, I guess. Okay. Right? That's, yeah. Sounds like uh, said with much wisdom. Sounds like okay. uh, many years of uh, of experience. And on the top, okay. So on the topic of of kind of fads and things that come and go, mm-hmm. buy, sell, or hold cryptocurrency as oh. a global medium of exchange. And like an eventual legitimate replacement of fiat currency. Okay. Okay. Not, not, we're not talking about it as an investment. We're talking about. No, it and, and I want to be clear for our listeners. Yeah, okay. we, we do not provide investment advice. We do lots of things. Right. This is not investment advice. This is, do you buy, sell, or hold cryptocurrency as a, a, a global medium of exchange? As a medium of exchange, I would say buy. Yeah. Yes. Just as an investment, I would say, no, thank you. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. What is it? What is it about crypto? High level. What is it about it that I would say buy to? Yeah. I just think it's a really just efficient way of of just transferring amounts of money. Like just, you know, like instead of physically having to do a, a physical transfer, it just makes a lot of sense to okay. do it completely electronically. All right. Buy, sell, or hold. Craft beer. Oh, big buyer. Yeah. So love, love beer and grew up on beer that was awful. You know, like in, in the <laughs> like late teenage years and early twenties, like beer was terrible. It all tasted the same, mass produced, just the worst. And now, gosh, we're so fortunate. We have so many local craft breweries everywhere. And yes, big buyer for sure. Okay. Buy, sell, or hold. Work from home as a, buy. like, as like a mainstream concept. Okay. Sorry. I'd already said buy, like instantly. Yeah, definitely working remotely. I love it. I know it's not for everybody. I'm definitely an introvert. And for me, you know, it doesn't bother me too much to have like limited, more limited interaction with people. Love uh, interacting with people when when I'm doing it, but I definitely do not need to be in an office full time for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Last question. Buy, sell, or hold X, formerly known as Twitter. Oh, gosh. Okay. Not the stock. Why well, it's not publicly traded okay. anymore. Just just acts right. as a. So these are not stock recommendations, right? Correct. Just buy or sell. You know, would I use it? Type thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say sell. I'm not really a social media person. In fact, I'm really not a social media person. Like one of the running jokes with my wife is that on Facebook she like checked me off as like her husband. I think it was like ten years ago, and I still haven't accepted because I've been on it. <laughs> okay. Basically, so it's like fair enough. Yeah, I think it gave up and stopped. It stopped prompting me to to confirm that fact um, because I hadn't. That's so, great. Yeah. All right. Well, that was fun. Thank you. Uh, thank you for playing. And uh, I think that sets the stage nicely to talk a little bit about about equity research, which is kind of the main event here. Hmm. Um, for those of our listeners that don't really know the role all that well, or are, you know, new to their finance career. Can you explain what an equity researcher does? Mm-hmm. Actually, actually, the the main job is exactly the, like the game we just played. It's like you have to decide buy, sell, or hold, but you need to do that for a public company. At the end of the day, that that's like the short answer of of what you're doing. And but you need to, you know, you can't just say buy, sell, or hold. You need to have, you need to have it supported by research that you've done and evidence to support that view but that's that's effectively the job yeah and what does career progression look like in that vertical so yeah interesting question so you you'd enter into that vertical as a research associate and then and when you come into that role you'd be reporting up to a research analyst and then you know being promoted from a research associate would mean you get promoted up to be a research analyst. Beyond analyst, if you're going to stay in research, the only place left to go would really be to the head of research. And there's only one job there. So it's it's a triangle that gets really thin at the top pretty quick. Having said that, equity research in general can be like a great stepping stone into other careers for sure, because you learn so many quantitative skills that you can then take over into other jobs, like say over onto the um, buy side, for example, or across over to a corporate development role as another example. And, and also, you know, jobs in investment banking, you're also learning those very similar quantitative skills that you can transport over into other roles as well. 
So you brought up two interesting points. It seems like relative to many other capital markets roles, it's it's flipped, right? So mm -hmm. usually an analyst is more of an entry level role when you move into associate. It's it's the opposite, right? With with equity research. Yeah. It's such a great point. And that's, you know, for the listeners that, you know, have not spent a lot of time analyzing the different roles. It's it's so true. And in equity research, you come in as a research associate, and then you could graduate up to a research analyst. In investment banking, you would enter in as an analyst and then would be promoted up to an associate position. I don't know why it's reversed right. in those two verticals, but it is, and it's an important distinction. So the other piece was, you mentioned you can move over to the buy side. So Mm -hmm. Equity research is typically a sell side function. So it's a two part question. Mm -hmm. How do they work? Sort of where do they fit within the sell side institution? And then the second part of that question is do buy side players also have equity researchers? Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's a great question. The first part of the question, I think, was like how equity research fits into the sell side. I always think of the sell side capital markets groups as being made up of four basic parts. You would have, say, investment banking equity research, sales, and trading. And when you're working in equity research, you're really producing products for the sales team and for the traders. So, you know, you're coming up with your buy, sell, or hold recommendations, you know, with your supporting evidence and you're publishing notes on that. And that's giving the sales team a lot of talking points that they can start to have discussions with when they're talking to portfolio managers. And then obviously if portfolio managers want to act on those particular ideas or opinions, then they can execute trades as well. So that's kind of how it fits together. And you can be really actively engaged with, with sales and trading when you work in research, for sure. Okay. So the second part of the question was, mm -hmm. is there an equivalent on the buy side or is everyone kind of an equity researcher when you work under a portfolio manager? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And thank you for reminding me about the second part of the question, because I would have forgotten about it. It it's definitely true. You can have like effectively equity research positions on the buy side as well that are very, very similar. In fact, there's been a trend towards more and more internal research being done on the buy side. A lot of that's because, you know, they don't necessarily want to rely on the sell side where, you know, as we know that they can have their own biases, they'd like to have their own in-house research on the buy side, be maintaining their own models, and then building building their own models means that they have a really, really deep understanding of the companies that they're considering investing in. Hmm. We, you've made a really compelling case to consider a career in this space. So let's get to our main event. <clears throat> As I understand it, you've curated a list of uh, the five most important things that you absolutely must know to be successful in equity research. And of course, these are Im implicit in that are like non-intuitive things. Obviously, you need to be good at modeling mm -hmm. and, and so on. Like, what are the five sort of non-intuitive things that, that you must know in order to be a successful equity researcher? Yeah, definitely. So not in any particular order, but let's, let's start with one of the things. And, and one of the things can be, you have to be looking forward all the time. Okay, so you, you, you will definitely encounter a lot of research notes that we'll talk about what happened, you know, backward looking, you know, company reported and here's, here's what they reported. And, but really your audience is, is looking forward into the future. So you can talk about backward looking events, but you really want to focus on, well, what do those backward looking things mean for the future? Is my view of the future the same or have these recent events now changed my view of the future in some way. I mean, one of the people that I used to work with, you know, had this joke and he basically said, whenever he'd encounter equity research that was almost completely backward looking, he, you know, he'd just say, oh, this is really helpful. You know, when, when we invent time travel, this will become a really useful piece of research. But until we have time travel, it's not useful for me to know what happened in the past unless we're using that information to help change our view of the future. So a natural tendency of a research uh, analyst could be to be looking backwards, but you really need to get past that and, and really focus on the what's going to happen part, which is really going to help the portfolio managers out on the buy side much, much hmm. more. 
Yeah. Okay. That's that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, see, so focus forward. Um, yeah. Okay, what's the uh, focus forward? What's yeah. what, what's the the next one? So the next one is, and this may be it may be obvious, but you have to have an opinion, you know, and that that can be difficult when you're starting out in equity research because the tricky thing is not only do you have to have an opinion, you have to put it in print. You know, and it's going to be out there in print forever. And if you're wrong, everybody will know that you're wrong. But you must have an opinion. That's effectively what the buy side is paying you for. You know, it's not helpful if you're wishy-washy and say, well, maybe this could happen or maybe this could happen or I'm not sure. Maybe this other thing could happen. That's not helpful for anyone. You need to um, formulate an opinion and express your opinion. And the one way that you can, I guess, be at ease with the idea of expressing your opinion and putting it out there is just know that not everyone's going to agree with you. In fact, a lot of people won't agree with you, but what they will appreciate is they will appreciate you, you trying to have an opinion and also being forthright with your opinion and telling them exactly what it is. They really, really appreciate that. That's interesting because as as an investor, as like a retail investor, if I don't know how I feel about Tesla, I just mm-hmm. ignore it. I don't have to have an opinion. I don't have to go long or short yep. or whatever. I just ignore it. But if you're covering mm-hmm. Tesla, you need yeah. to have an opinion on it, um, whether you, you like do. it or not. You certainly do. I mean, there can be moments of time where you can put something on a hold recommendation or a neutral, as it's sometimes called. You know, but one of the, the things that I, I remember distinctly working very, very closely with the trading desk. And I remember the head trader at one point showing me that he only had a buy ticket and a sell ticket. He didn't have a hold ticket, you know, so they just, they can give you a hard time. Like it's okay right. to have a hold for a little while, but eventually you need an opinion, which is going to, you know, they can't, they just can't do anything. A trader can't do anything with the hold. There's no right. action there. So yeah, definitely you want to have an opinion. You you want to be instructing people to either move one way or the other. Like I said, it's okay to have a hold for a little while. You can't leave a hold on there for, for a number of years. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Got it. Got it. Um, okay. So focusing forward, uh, you always need to have an opinion. Mm-hmm. What's number three? Oh, okay. So fo- it, maybe it follows along a little bit with the having a, an opinion bit. It's that you, you have to have thick skin. Oh my gosh. You have to have thick skin because the thing is, is that, and you can ask people, you know, how, how often are research analysts right? You know, the best ones in the world are only right 60% of the time. Is it so that little? It's that little. Yeah. At least it's over 50. I mean, if it wasn't over 50, so. you, would, you wouldn't hire them. Right. But so, but even like, it's hard to even maintain that average of being right 60% of the time over long periods. So it means that 40% of the time your clients are, are frustrated or angry with you or you weren't right. So you really just have to have thick skin. You know, you just Hmm. have to be able to persevere through it and think about, okay, well, maybe I'm wrong 40% of the time, but I am adding value for them, right? I'm, I'm right more than the market is. And so that's, that's all that you're trying to do. And you have to just let, if you're getting negative comments from time to time, it just has to be like water off a duck's back, you know, just keep driving forward and don't worry about it you know, and try to learn from it along the way. That That's interesting to me as an outsider because it may be even a little counterintuitive because you think of equity research as a role where someone who's very introverted, very analytical, mm-hmm. doesn't want to put themselves out there, like doesn't want yeah. to be on an investment banking desk or in a sales or trading role. Mm-hmm. Um, but yet they're expected to put their stamp of approval on every single piece of research and their name actually ends up out in public quite a lot. So that, that's kind of an interesting... Um, element here. It's a really interesting element. Yeah. And, and, and you'll encounter some which are sometimes okay with the idea of putting their thoughts and opinions out there on paper, but they, they won't want to interact in person as much. And those would be the research analysts who really don't go out marketing in person as often. Maybe they aren't on the phone as much and they prefer just to publish on paper or in PDF format. But either they need to find a way that they are comfortable and and get those opinions out there for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thick skin, number three. What else do you have on your list? 
Well, it's it's an interesting one. I mean, you just when you and it's hard to maybe boil it down into one one punchline, but it it revolves around the idea of you know, when you're in equity research, you are entitled to independent thought. Okay? So you can say whatever you want. You can say you can put sell recommendations on on everything, you can put hold recommendations on everything. But at the end of the day, the one thing that you need to remember is you're working for a group that sells equities. Okay. At the end of the day, that's what a capital markets group does. They're selling, on the sell side. Yeah. They're on the sell side. They're selling equities. They're either doing IPOs or they're doing equity follow on offerings. So that's fine if you want to take your portfolio of 10 companies and put them all on sell recommendations and be negative on the whole sector. That's fine. But if you want to keep your job, you better then find another sector that you're actually bullish on, right? Hmm. Because there's no way that you're going to be able to make money as a, as a group, as a working group capital market, if you're negative on everything, right? So you can be independent, but be prepared for there may be a day when your sector rolls over and, and you're like, you're, you want to put the entire portfolio on hold or on sell but then you're going to have to find something else to do with your career, <laughs> find a different hmm. sector. For me, I worked within the mining sector, so it wasn't finding a different sector. It would just be like, oh, okay, well, maybe this particular commodity is out of favor now for a couple of years. So let's transition over into covering a different commodity where we're actually really, really bullish on it. And we really like the prospects for some of the companies there. So this concept of independence sounds like it may be somewhat controversial, but I'm, I'm sure it's also maybe one of the worst kept secrets on Wall Street to some extent mm -hmm. too, right? Yeah. You're definitely entitled to independent thought, but you also need to, re to remember, of course, that you, you have a job to do and you're a part of a business. And so, you know, if, if you were to encounter a situation where all of a sudden you became negative on your entire sector, put everything on a sell recommendation, and then didn't pick up coverage of anything else, you'd be out of a job. You know, because your your group would not be able to sell the products that it's designed to sell effectively. Mm -hmm. To um, boil that one down into a one-liner, but it's just an interesting thing to think about. I don't need to. One-liners are good; they're catchy for social media. But but no, it's a it's a point well taken. And and what's number five? Number five, I would say the idea of even on the sell side would be talking less and listening more. This, this would be another, hmm. it's pretty uh, counterintuitive thing, really, because you think about the sell side, you know, instinctively people would think, okay, well, you're, you're supposed to have an opinion and then you want to be communicating those opinions out. Well, that's true. That's what you're doing the most, most of the time, but you can just learn so much by listening and asking a lot of questions so that, because when you think about it, when you're talking to people on the buy side, they are the market and they can move the market in, in big volume because they're managing. You're talking about like, like portfolio managers at funds and mm. asset management firms? Okay. Yes, 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 yes. They have the ability to move large portions of the market, you know? And so I would always really, really like to, if they're open to it, you know, asking them questions and, and start to think about how they're feeling, you know, about the particular sector or the investments, because you can learn so much. And then if you go out, if you spend a week or two marketing and you do a lot of listening, you're going to come back from that trip and you're going to have a really, really good read on what the buy side is feeling about these particular mm -hmm. investments. And it gives you some insight into how it may move in the future, because effectively, you, you know, collectively how they're all thinking and how they're feeling about the investment. So that, that's a really, really important one. And also when you're interacting with the buy side, they're not used to a sell side analyst asking them questions, kind of throws them off guard. And, but a lot of them are really open to it because a lot of the time they don't get a chance to communicate their own views in those meetings. So I used to do that a ton, it took me a while to figure it out. But then, then once I started doing it, I, I realized how sort of advantageous and interesting it was. And I used to do tons of that in equity research. It's so interesting because I guess if a critical mass of institutional investors are bearish on a sector, mm -hmm. it can start to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
Definitely. Is there trimming positions and, and uh, have your supply demand a little bit out of whack? So that that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Definitely counterintuitive. It Yeah, definitely counterintuitive. And it can start to, if you're going through, say, if you've been going through a bull market for some time, but you're constantly asking them questions and all of a sudden they start saying, yeah, I don't know, valuations are getting a little stretched, multiples are a little bit high. Well, then that's giving you insight that, yeah, we may be getting closer to a top if they're starting to feel that way. So then you can start looking for evidence of a top that may be coming. And then and then that'll obviously help to inspire, you know, your own opinions and, and your research as you write it. I ask a question. Yeah. You always think about, so the news release comes out at 6 a.m., right, on a, co a company that you're covering. <clears throat> so yeah. Is there... What's more valuable? Is it being first to market with your report or is it being maybe not necessarily the, the first mover, but the most detailed equity research report thereafter? Maybe you could be third or fourth or, or fifth. Do you, mm -hmm. Does that question make sense? It does. It does make sense. And it's like, it's, it's a trade-off. If, if you're first out, first note out there, okay, you don't necessarily, your comment does not need to be as good <laughs> because Okay. Uh, it's a bit of a trade-off. Like just getting out there first has value because you can literally just provide a summary to the buy side about what happened without too much of an opinion. And they can get value from that because you've been able to react so quickly and that time is valuable to them. Um, if you wait and you're slow and, you know, by the time your comment gets out, there's already 10 comments out there, then your comment better be good. Right. right. Yeah. Better be like really good. Oh, better be really good because they've already had 10 comments hit their desk. They all know now what happened. So you're going to need to tell them something incremental that no one else picked up on. Or you're going to need to maybe you tell them the same factual things, but you have an interesting twist on it or a slightly different opinion or interpretation or a different outlook into the future. But you need something to differentiate yourself if you're that late. I used to take kind of a balance between those two approaches. I always wanted to be as fast as possible, but I never wanted to be, for instance, like I would never be first if it meant that I hadn't really analyzed things and I hadn't formed an opinion. I needed to get to an opinion and have a view before I put out a comment. And it usually meant that I wasn't the first one out, but I, that I wouldn't be the last one out either. I was somewhere in the middle. Yeah. First for first sake, maybe maybe not worth it consistently. For me, it for me it wasn't but for some people that's the approach that they like to take and it and it can work very well for some people if they can always be first out and then they don't necessarily as i mentioned don't need to have as much an opinion they can just be adding value by um having a quick summary out there for people what was it about equity research that attracted you in the first place so early on it was i wanted i wanted more challenge in the work that i was doing and i was also so I was working in, in the mining industry as an engineer selling to other engineers in the mining industry. And it was, it was interesting, but the equipment I was selling was like year over year, the only difference would be, okay, 10% more horsepower on this particular, you know, drill that they're using at this mine. I was like, okay, that's not that interesting. <laughs> so it was, it was so challenging to, to transition into equity research because the, the problems that you're working on are so complex and, and interesting and multifaceted. I was just fascinated with learning the quantitative side near the beginning. Mm -hmm. But as things progressed through with equity research, I, I found more and more and more challenges later in my career. As I progressed later in my career in equity research, I started to really, really appreciate um, a lot of the quantitative aspects of the role, in particular, the psychology of the markets. I just started to just love learning about the psychology of markets and, you know, how they might be uh, efficient, but they can be incredibly irrational at times and, you know, unlock huge opportunities sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's how it, that's how it started for me. And that's a little bit about how it, how it progressed as well. So if I had to summarize our, our five main takeaways. Mm. Focus forward would be one. Definitely. Right? Yep. You always need to have an opinion. Mm -hmm. Thick skin. 
The fourth was around independence. Maybe we'll call yep. it, you have independence, but perhaps only on paper. There, There's <laughs> more to it behind the scenes. You say that. Sure. Yeah. And the one I, I found really interesting was talk less and, and listen more. Yeah, definitely. That one's that, one's that a fair summary? That, that's a great summary. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, this has been incredibly insightful. I have to say that you've answered a lot of questions that I had and some that I didn't even know that I had. So, you know, I want to thank you for your time. I, I usually try to sort of ask everyone one question, which mm-hmm. is if you weren't doing what you're doing now at CFI, what would you be doing? Oh gosh, it's a great question. I love what I do. So, so it's a tough question. I think if I was doing something else, it would, it would still involve teaching, I believe in, in some capacity, because I absolutely just love it. Teaching for me is first of all, something that I feel like I'm good at, but also it's such a nice opportunity to, to give back to people. It's kind of like, what were all the things that I wish I knew 20 years ago when I started off in, in finance and, and how can I, you know, communicate those to other people so that I can help them early on the things that I w- really wish that I'd known way back in the beginning. So I think it would vo- involve teaching in some capacity, Kyle. I don't know exactly what that would be, but definitely it would be within the teaching sphere for sure. Well, Duncan, I think you've, you've delivered on that and more, and, and hopefully many thousands of people can, can download a bit of this wisdom from you. And, and thank you so much for, for sharing it. I think it was really valuable and we appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Kyle. Thanks for inviting me on. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Net Learnings. This podcast is powered by CFI, an organization on a mission to enhance the skills, knowledge, and productivity of finance and banking professionals. If you enjoyed what you heard in this episode, make sure to follow Net Learnings wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Or visit us online at corporatefinanceinstitute.com slash podcast. See you next time.